Welcome back to another captivating chapter in our exploration of functional analysis. If you are joining us for the first time, well, congratulations on making this far without us. And please don't forget to hit that subscribe button to become part of our ever-growing mathematical community. And of course, I mean, hurry up, subscribe now as the number of places is limited. I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I mean, it's infinite actually. So. Um, in our previous discussions, we delve into some heavyweight concepts like the risk representation, um, I mean, not the risk representation theorem, but I mean the risk freedom theory and the fred home um, alternative, unraveling thereby um, the intricate behaviors of linear operators within the mathematical domains. So as we set sail for our next destination, I mean, we find ourselves venturing into the alluring um, realm of spectral theory, right? where our focus will be on understanding the spectrum of a compact operator. But what does the compact, I mean, what does the spectrum, I mean, of a compact operator actually, um, I mean, really entail? Um, well, um, picture it as a powerful spotlight, right, that illuminates the behavior of linear operators. For, I mean, for a given compact operator, uh, we can, the Banach space, right? The spectrum basically serves as a guide, right? Highlighting those values where the operator encounters a bit of a struggle, right? failing to say to to achieve that perfect balance needed for a smooth mathematical operation. I mean, you can think of it as um, I mean, it's like identifying the edges of a puzzle, right? Where some pieces seem to resist fitting snugly um, into the picture perfect solution. So understanding the spectrum of a compact operator is more than just a mathematical endeavor. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's the compass, I would say, right, that guides us in investigating the behavior of these operators and their, their relationship um, um, with the space they live on. So just as understanding the weather forecast helps plan your day, comprehending the spectrum equips mathematicians, like we mathematicians, to navigate the intricacies of spectral theory, revealing thereby insight about the very nature of these operators and these spaces, the, the influence. So we will start right away with some, I mean, a couple of definitions. So, definition. Okay, good. So let um, T be a linear bounded operator. Oops. Right from E into itself, right? So we start with the first definition, A. So the resolvent map the resolvent of of t, not the resolvent map yet, right? So the resolvent of t is defined by we call it rho of t, right? I think this is the usual notation. So those are the set of lambda in k, right? The scalar field such that t minus lambda times identity at times i will just write t minus lambda so so those are the lambda in k such that t minus lambda is bijective right from of course from e on to e Okay, good. But um, by the way, yeah, I mean, we basically work on the scalar field R, right? But you can also make it on C, there's no problem. So, and as, as I said earlier, um, we often write T minus lambda instead of T minus lambda times the identity operator that I denoted by capital I. Okay, so, um, well, this set could also be written as the set of lambda in K such that um, T minus 
lambda is under the inverse of this. Um, well, let me just drag it a bit to the to the left. This is again so that this is actually a linear bounded to Pirito. So that this exists. Right? So this equality um, basically follows from the fact that um, oops, good. It follows from the fact that um, I mean any linear <coughs> sorry, I mean it follows from the fact that any linear bounded um, operator T right um, between Banach spaces of course between Banach spaces um, that is bijective has a continuous inverse I think this was actually, um, I think this was corollary 2.7, right? So I strongly invite you to to watch my video on Han Banach, theorems and friends. Yeah, I think it was the very first lecture of this um, of this lecture series. So yeah, that was corollary 2.7. Okay, so now. Um, we now define the resolvent map that I talked about earlier. So the resolvent map is defined by the resolvent map is defined by um, we often call it <coughs> sorry. We often call it. Um, <coughs> we often call it um, R, defined from the resolvent of T into the space of linear bounded operator, right? Which maps lambda to call it the R of lambda T, right? Which is um, T minus lambda. I mean the inverse of T minus lambda. Okay, so this is how we define the resolvent map, and our next definition is the spectrum of T. So the spectrum of T, right, denoted by, denoted, I mean, it is usually denoted by sigma T, right. So this is actually, um, I mean, it is nothing else than the complement of the resolvent set. So this is the complement of the resolvent set, right? So this means that um, probably use this color. Oops, sigma t is r minus. <coughs> As I said, this is because um, I'm working over a Banach, I mean, on a Banach space over the over the fit r. So, but of course, this r uh, could be. I mean, this could be c, right? The space of complex number. Okay, so um, our last definition is. The and not really the last right, so the point spectrum of T denoted sigma P. Maybe I use another color. Not a sigma pt, right? Is defined by those are the lambda in the spectrum for which t minus lambda is not injective. So this is sigma pt is 
you have the lambda in the spectrum of, of t, right, such that t minus lambda, and of course times identity, right, is, is not is not one to one, right? It's not injective. Well, um, it's actually very useful to note that every lambda in the point spectrum, right, is called eigenvalue, right? And each x that you take into the kernel of t minus lambda, right? That doesn't vanish, right? Is called eigen vector or eigen function, depending on the space, right? It's called eigen vector or eigen function associated to to the eigen value lambda. Okay, so finally the last definition is the approximate point spectrum. So the approximate point spectrum of t, right? I mean of a linear bound of the t, right? Is defined by Is defined by sigma. We put AP as a subset to say approximate. Right? Sigma APT is actually the set of lambda in sigma t, right? Such that um, there exists a sequence, we call it um, Xn, right? Of element of E, right? Of norm 1. And such that the norm of of t minus lambda applied to x n right goes to zero. So this is how we define the approximate point spectrum right of a linear bounded operator. Now I think it is um, it is easy, easy to obs to observe that when you observe that. Um, if a lambda is actually in the approximate point spectrum, right? Then t minus lambda is not continuously invertible. Um, well, let's have a short proof, right? Um, indeed, um, assume assume you have a lambda in the approximate point spectrum of of t, right? Which is a linear bound operator. Then you have that the norm of t minus lambda, I mean the operator norm of the inverse, right? By definition, this is actually the supremum over um, the norm of t minus lambda minus 1 of cy right, divided by the norm of y right, over the y of course different from 0 and y in e. But this is again, I mean this you can show, this is again the supremum over all n right, of the norm of um, t minus lambda minus 1 of y n. divided by the norm of yn. And again, um, this is 
equal to the supremum over n height of the norm of xn divided by the norm of t minus lambda applied to xn right i mean this equality um just followed by replacing yn by t minus minus lambda xn right I mean, if you even want to be on the safe side, you can even, I mean, instead of hiking the equality, you can probably hide the, I mean, the, I mean, have um, an upper bound, right? So, okay, so this is less or equal or equal, right? I mean, depending on what you decided again. So this is the supremum of, um, of one over the norm of t minus lambda xn over n right this is because i mean this is this has norm one i mean the xn actually based on the units here oops yeah this norm is one so so and this is exactly infinity right because um, because lambda is, is actually an element of the approximate point spectrum, you know that this actually goes to goes to zero. So we obviously have, I mean, we clearly clearly have that the approximate point spectrum of T is a subset of the spectrum of T. Okay, so now let's have um, a couple of remarks. So remark. So the first point is that um, first bullet point is that the point spectrum of T right is a subset of the spectrum of T right. I mean this is even obvious right. And in general, um, in general, this inclusion, this inclusion. And be strict, right? As they may exist, um, some lambda such that um, the kernel of T minus lambda equals to the singleton zero, right? And for which the range of t minus lambda i is different from me. So you can basically find some value of lambda for which um, t minus lambda i is, is injective but not subjective. So the second point, I mean the second remark is that um, the point spectrum of t, right, is contained into the approximate point spectrum of t, right, which is a subset of the spectrum of T, right? And also the boundary, which I did not buy this, or the frontier, right? Of the spectrum of T, right? Is a subset of the approximate point spectrum of T, right? So. And of course, this holds for, I mean, for every linear bounded operator. T, right so this I leave it to you right so try it out and again if you face any issue feel free to to I mean to drop your comment I mean question or queries in the comment and then I'll be happy to to provide an answer okay so now let's state our very first proposition to proposition 6.7 okay so um, the spectrum of a bounded operator t is always compact so the spectrum of 
many individuals. The spectrum sigma t right, of a bounded operator the bounded operator t is is compact like and we even have that in the spectrum of of t is contained into um, minus the operator norm of t common norm of t okay so let's go into the proof So we proceed, um, I mean, proceed by contraposition, right? Um, so by contraposition, so in fact, our goal is to show that um, the spectrum of T is contained into this interval, right? So we proceed by contradiction. Why are we starting um, to show this inclusion before showing that? The spectrum is compact. Well, for the simple reason that if you show that um, the spectrum of T is contained into this interval, then um, I mean that implies that the spectrum of T is actually um, is bounded, and then we also use the fact that it is also close as being the complement of of the resolvent set, right? And the resolvent set is actually open, so we have a closed and bounded set, right? In R or in C, right? And therefore, um, compactness will, will follow immediately. Okay, so um, by contraposition, let um, lambda in in R, I mean, it could be C, right? Be such that the absolute value of lambda is greater than the norm of the operator norm of T. So let me just recall what we had to prove. So we had to prove that we had to prove that um, lambda is not in the spectrum of t, right? So this means that t minus lambda minus one exists, right? Okay. So for that we use um, a black box, right? So black box and this is known on the Neumann series oops okay so the first property is that let T be a linear bounded operator from E into itself, right? Assume assume that I mean E is a vector is a non-vector space of course. Now assume that um, this series converges. In operator norm, so in the space of linear in the space of linear bounded operators. Right, I mean by t to the power k, I mean this is the k composition, right? I mean t you compose t k times, right? Okay. So if this series converges, then identity minus t, right, is invertible. And um, we use this color, and identity minus t inverse, right? It's exactly I mean this series, right? Okay, so in part B, you have that if A is even a Banach space, right? If E is a Banach space, right? So if you are even working in the Banach space, let me just highlight Banach space. Mm. 
then oops, then a is fulfilled right and we even have that I mean, we can even characterize the you know, the norm of identity minus t or the norm of the inverse of this operator as being less or equal than one over one minus the the norm of t. Right? I mean, this should look um, familiar to you, right? When you have the geometric series, right? I mean, this is exactly I mean that times the the bound you get. Okay, so this is this is the black box that we are going to use. Let me just. Um, Oops. I'm just tie it a bit right. This is perfect perfect way to waste to waste time. Good. Let me just do the same here. Okay, good. So this is the black box that we are going to use. So, um, well, now let's go back to the proof. Okay. So now we have that, I mean, we can write t minus lambda, I mean the inverse of this as minus lambda to the power minus one, right? So the inverse of lambda times identity minus lambda minus one times t inverse. Now, since we assume that the absolute value of lambda is strictly greater than the norm of t, right? This means that the norm of lambda minus one times t, right, is actually strictly less than one. And t is actually a linear bound of perimeter. So it follows by, I will just say, Neumann series in our black box. So it follows, follows by Neumann series that um, t minus lambda minus one is equal to minus lambda minus one times the summation lambda to the power k to the minus k sorry um, t to the power k right. For that this is an element, I mean it's a linear bound of the pivotal k moving from zero to to infinity. And of course, once again, I said t to the power k here means t composed with t k times. So this means that lambda is an element of the resolvent of, of t, right? And therefore, lambda cannot be in the spectrum of t. So with this, we have proof that the spectrum of t is bounded, right? And as I said, close also, bounded and close, right? Since the resolvent of t is open, once you have compactness. So this is the end of the proof, and let me just comment a bit about the openness of the resolvent map, right? I mean, if you have, um, if you let lambda be an element of the resolvent of, I mean, the resolvent set of T, right? Then, I mean, the goal, I mean, to, 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 to show openness, right, you have to find the ball around lambda that is contained into, into O of T, right? So I claim, this is what I mean. You you have to show it, right? Because I'm not going into that. 
So I claim that um, the ball centered at lambda and I just norm of r lambda here minus one, right? This then this is contained into the resolvent of t. Oops. Where um, I mean r lambda here is just uh, I mean it's just my shortcut right for I mean for the map for the resolvent um, I think we define the yeah I define the 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 resolvent map at the beginning. Okay, so um now um let's state our first theorem also. So theorem six point eight think the most important theorem of this lecture. So let T now be a compact operator, right? On an infinite dimensional space, right? So with dimension of A being infinite. Then you have First assertion is that zero is always an element of the spectrum of T. So if you have a compact operator, then that compact operator is um, I mean it's never invertible. Never, never. Right? Because zero is actually in the spectrum. So this means T is I mean the inverse of T um, I mean doesn't exist. Okay, so the second assertion is that um, in B, you have that the point spectrum of of T right minus zero, right, is exactly the spectrum of T minus minus the, minus the zero element, right, minus the zero. And finally, um, one of the following condition hold. One of the following. Case holds true, right? So um, we use bullet point. So either the spectrum of T is equal to the singleton zero, right? Or the spectrum of T um, minus the singleton zero is a finite set. Or the spectrum of T minus singleton zero is a sequence, the sequence converging to converging to to zero, right? I mean, um, Sigma T minus zero can I mean we can label element of the spectrum right in a sequence say lambda n that converges to to zero. Okay, so um let's go into the proof. So we start with the first uh, the first point, right? So let's prove that um Let's prove that zero is always in the spectrum of T. Right, so this is what we want to show. Okay, so we proceed by contradiction. So suppose not. Right? So this means that zero is not an element of the spectrum of T. Right? Then T is bijective, right? So the inverse exists. Then T is bijective, and I mean, it's also a linear bounded to, and I mean, T is bijective, and the inverse is a linear bounded to periodical. And therefore, it follows that identity, which can be written as T composed with T minus 1, 
it's compact right i mean we saw this I mean, you saw that if i have a compact operator and, and also have a linear bounded operator i mean in appropriate spaces then the composition is a compact operator then identity is compact um this um the closed unit ball in e right, which is not in less than the image of the closed unit ball in e via the identity right, is compact right and by the risk theorem And by the risk theorem, I think this was, um, I mean, this was theorem, theorem, um, I think it was theorem 6.5, yeah. Let me just highlight. So by the risk theorem, I mean, E must be finite dimensional. So the dimension of E should be finite. Right, which is which is a contradiction. Okay, so A is proof, right? So now in B, so we want to show, so let's show that the spectrum of T minus um, minus zero so if I just write it down yeah is equal to the point spectrum of t minus zero good so we already I mean we already have that um, the point spectrum of t minus zero is contained into the spectrum of t minus minus zero right this we know by definition of the point spectrum now we want to show the i mean the reverse inclusion or the converse inclusion so now let um let lambda in in the spectrum of t right lambda being different of zero so we show both We shall prove that lambda is is an eigenvalue. So this is our goal. Again, we proceed by contradiction. So suppose not. Right? Suppose not. That means. Um, that the kernel of t minus lambda is equal to the singleton zero. Then in this case, by the Fred Holm alternative theorem, so by the Fred Holm alternative theorem. I also want to invite you to watch my video on the Fred Home alternative right? if you didn't so far. So by the Fred Home alternative theorem, um, I mean this was maybe I should also mention, probably not, right? but this was actually theorem 6.6 right, so let me just write it, which is theorem 6.6 property C right so let me just highlight so by the Fred Holm alternative theorem we know that the range the range of T minus lambda is equal to to E right so this means that t minus lambda is adjective, right? I mean, let me just put it here. So this means that t 
y menos lambda is subjective right subjective and therefore um, the inverse exists right? because it was also injective so it is bijective so um, and therefore lambda is actually in the resolvent of t right? which is a contradiction Which is a contradiction because we assume that lambda is actually in the in the spectrum of t at the beginning. So so this is the end of this of the proof of this um, of this um, assertion. So c um, for the proof of c. So for the proof. Of C, right? We shall use the following lemma that I'm going to recall in a second. So this is um, lemma six point two. Okay, so let um, T again be a compact operator, right? And let, um, let's say lambda N, right? Be a sequence of distant real numbers, right? As I said, I'm working over the scalar field R and not C, but the results are similar, right? Even if you're working on C, so it's totally fine. So let um, lambda n be a sequence of distant real numbers, right? Such that, such that lambda n converges to lambda, right? To some lambda, right, and um, lambda n are uh, element of the spectrum of t, right, minus zero for every n. So in this case, we can conclude that lambda is exactly zero. So in other words, I mean, this theorem actually says that. Um, all points of the spectrum of t right minus zero are isolated points okay so probably i should write it down so in other words so this means that all points of the spectrum of t right minus zero are isolated Point. Oops. Okay, so let's go into the proof, which is a bit lengthy, but um, lengthy but instructive and really nice, I would say. So proof. So let um, lambda n right be a sequence of distant numbers distant real numbers huh? so let me just write real here real numbers such that so let me just highlight um distant right it's actually very important in the in the theorem i mean the lemma above also such that 
um, lambda n converges to some lambda and lambda n those are I mean, elements of the spectrum and all different from zero right for every n so we know that so we know that lambda n is actually in the point spectrum of t right I mean, this is actually um, by assertion B that we prove, right? We prove that the spectrum of T minus zero is exactly the point spectrum of T minus, minus zero. So the under N are all eigenvalues. So there exist um, corresponding eigenvectors. So let en right different from zero the eigenvectors the eigenvectors that means that t minus lambda en right is equal to zero now let I me mean, let's define the set capital en right um, let E n be the space spanned by the by the small E n side E one up to E n. So we claim that. So claim. <coughs> sorry. So claim. Um, we claim that the set E n is actually um, increasing. That E n is containing to E n plus one. And that they are even different, right? So, so you you have a kind of a strict increasing. And this is of course for for every n, right? Okay. So, um, well, in order to show that, um, I mean, e n is contained to e n plus one. It's actually enough for us to take that for all n, the vectors um, e one, small e one, e two, pre n. Are linearly independent right so this will be enough so it's enough I mean we are already in the in the proof of the claim right it's enough to check to take that for for all n right the vectors E1 up to En are linearly independent. So the proof is actually by induction, right? Over N, right? This is how we proceed. So assume this hold. Assume that this hold up to up to n right and suppose and suppose that I mean suppose by contradiction maybe I should mention it so you don't get lost suppose by contradiction that I mean you want to I mean here we already want to show that the composition is true at the rank n plus one right so I assume by contradiction that it is not true, right? That means that En plus one, that means a linear combination of of the En, right? I mean of the previous En, right? So this is the summation of the alpha i e i i running from one to n. Then we know that t of En plus one plus t is a linear operator. This will be equal to the summation of alpha i t e i right i running from one to n again so this will not change right so um, but observe that i mean this t e i is exactly equal to lambda i e i right because um, the lambda n are all in the point spectrum right they are all 
eigenvalues. So this is again equal to the summation over i running from 1 to n of alpha i times lambda i e i, right? But t e n plus 1, right, by definition, should be equal to, I mean, um, how would I put it? But this should be equal also to the summation of alpha i alpha i lambda n plus 1 e i right i running from 1 to 2 n right because lambda n plus 1 is also I mean it's also an eigen it's also an eigen value right it's in this point spectrum of in the point spectrum of t right so you should have um should have um how would I put it t e n plus 1 E equal to lambda um, n plus 1 e n plus 1 right so from this relation so it follows that so from these two relation here from these two here right so you should move one side to to the other side right for the the, the right hand side to the left hand side so it follows that um, So it follows that um, also due to the fact that the ANs are linearly independent, right? I moving from one to n. For that alpha i times lambda i minus lambda n plus one equals to zero. And this holds for every i running from one up to n, right? And probably I should do it, right? Because I say that from these two here. Right from these two relations here, we should move one side, I mean probably the right hand side to the left hand side. Then you get that the summation of the alpha i um, times lambda i minus lambda n plus one ei i running from one to n equal to zero. So now because the ei i um, i running from one to n are linearly independent, right? It follows that the alpha i, I mean the coefficient. Uh, all zero, right? So with this, um, but from this we can conclude that alpha i equals to zero for for every i only from one up to n. This for the simple reason that the lambda i is all distant, meaning that the difference of lambda i minus lambda n plus one is actually different from zero. Right, which is which is a contradiction to the fact that e n plus one is an eigenvector. Which is a contradiction. Hence, e n is the proper subspace of e n plus one for every n. Now, um. Applying applying the Ries lemma, right? Again, please, I strongly invite you to visit my lecture on the Ries Redholm theory, right? Where I discuss the Ries lemma and also the Ries theorem. I think this was actually. Um, This was lemma 6.1. So, applying the base lemma, we may construct um, a sequence. Let's call it UN, right? Such that I mean the norm of UN oops equals one and UN lives in EN for every N and also the distance of UN to 
en minus 1, right, is actually greater or equal than 1 over 2, right, for every gain greater or equal than 2, of course. Now, for um, observe that for m strictly less than n, right, you have you have that em minus 1 is strictly contained into em, right, which is strictly contained into en minus 1, which is strictly contained into, into n. But on the other hand, it is clear that on the other hand, it is clear that um, t minus lambda n apply to, I mean, of en, capital en, right, is actually contained into en minus 1, right? I mean, this is, um, I mean, this is actually easy to check, right? So, so we does have that the norm of um, of t u n right, divided by by lambda n minus the norm of t u m divided by lambda m. Right? So this is equal to the norm of t u n minus lambda n u n right, divided by lambda n right, minus um, t u m minus lambda n u m divided by lambda m right, plus u n minus minus u n. Right, I think so. Yes, something like this. Yes. Okay, now observe that um, well, maybe we start here. Observe that this is an element of en minus one, right? This one, an element of of em, right? Which is actually strictly contained into en minus one, right? And this is obviously um is obviously an element of of em, right? Which is again contained into en minus one. So this norm, we can say that this is greater or equal than the distance of u n to e n minus one, and this is greater or equal than one over two, right? By our Ries, um, the Ries lemma. Now, if lambda n actually goes to lambda, right, and lambda is different from zero, right, we have a contradiction. You have a contra. You have a contradiction, right? Because in that situation, u n um, divided by lambda. I mean, this sequence, right? It's a bounded sequence. It's a bounded sequence, and t is compact. I mean, it's a compact operator. Which means that we should be able to extract the convergence subsequence, which is not the case here, right? right? So this means t of u n, the lambda n. I mean, the image sequence, right? Must have or must contain, right? Convergent. subsequence. But this is not actually the case because we saw that the norm of t u n over lambda n minus t u m over lambda n is actually um, lower bounded by 1 over 2. So I mean, it can never go to 0, it can never extract the subsequence that goes to 0. So this is a contradiction. So um, well, 
so maybe now we can go back to the proof of theorem 6.8 so proof I mean that was a identity proof which would like make that so proof of theorem 6.8 right this is the continuation so and then we wanted to prove C right C was saying that either the spectrum of T is singleton zero right or the spectrum of t minus zero is a finite set, right? Or this is a sequence, so sigma t um, minus zero is a sequence converging to zero. Okay, so this is what we wanted to prove, right? Okay, so um, observe that for every n greater equal than one, right, the set um, sigma t, right, intersected with the set of lambda in in R, right, such that the absolute value of lambda is is greater or equal than one over n. I mean, this set is either empty. is either empty or finite right in fact if this set had um, infinitely many elements right had infinitely many points we would have would have a subsequence right a subsequence um, that converges to that converges to some lambda with the absolute value of lambda or the module of lambda if you're working on the the field C, so that the absolute value of lambda is greater or equal than, than 1 over n, right? This is because um, the spectrum of T is compact, right? And this is actually, I mean, and this would contradict, I mean, if you take the limit, then you will see that the absolute value of lambda should be strictly greater than zero, and this would contradict would contradict um, lemma six point two, right? The lemma that we just proved. Lemma six point two, right? As we just write it as lambda. I mean, as this will be simply greater than zero, meaning that lambda is different from zero. Okay, so hence, if the spectrum of t minus minus zero, right, has um, infinitely by the way, um, with this um, here, I mean, we prove that, I mean, that sigma t is either singleton zero or sigma, um, sigma t minus this is a finite set. So if this has infinitely um, many distant points and probably this comment here doesn't have um, its place well so we see that so hence if the spectrum of t minus um, minus zero has infinitely many distant points 
we may order them as a sequence tending to zero. Like we we always we may order them. That's a sequence changing. Tending to zero. So um so this concludes the proof of property C and also um, this lecture on the spectrum of a compact operator. So thank you for joining me. Um, as I said, don't forget to subscribe, right? Don't just watch from the sideline or, I mean, be part of this, um, of our vibrant community, right? And take this opportunity to sharpen your mathematical knowledge, right? And also, um, why why not um, well um, let's grow together right so by discussing and creating a network of mathematicians so see you in the next video